final Nanoit Tech seminar for sp spring semester. You're cheering? <laughs> made it. <laughs> for the spring semester of uh, 2016, we'll start up again in August, and uh, you'll, of course, get all of those notices. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Amanda, Professor Amanda Stockton. Uh, Amanda did her undergraduate work at MIT with getting a degree in both chemistry and aerospace engineering. Uh, she then did a master's in chemistry at uh, Brown before going to graduate school at the University of California, Berkeley, where she got her PhD also in chemistry. She then spent some time uh, doing postdoctoral work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and Caltech before coming to Georgia Tech uh, just early last year in 2015 where she is currently an assistant professor in the School of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you guys for coming. Um, can you hear me in the back okay? Raise your hand if you can hear me. Okay. Um, so what I want you to do is, if you ever cease to be able to hear me, to wave. Because I'm still talking, I promise. Um, so as David said, I've been here for a short amount of time, only a year and a couple of months. But I really wanted to give you a feel for what my group is doing, where we're headed, and, um, and what's going on. Uh, now what we do is we use microfluidic approaches to try to solve some of the big questions of astrobiology. And many times I like to show a slide asking what is astrobiology and show pictures of all these aliens from, from sci-fi and stuff. Um, but rather than do that, I just want to ask you, what, what is astrobiology? What does that word mean to you? Anyone have an answer? Aliens in space. Aliens in space. Um, and that, that's how you would interpret this, right? So we've got an alien down in the basement, a mosey that we dissect, and that's what my group does? No. No, 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 no. Um, what we're doing is we're looking at answering some of the big questions that people have asked since we became people. And we're interested in looking at, is there life beyond Earth? And how could we possibly find hints that it exists and detect it if it's there? Um, we're interested in what are the limits of life on Earth? Um, and how does that pertain to some of these other places that we could go? And we're also interested in how does life begin and evolve? And at the center of all of that is microfluidics. And our core technology are programmable microfluidics that I'll show you in some detail uh, using microchip capillary electrophoresis with laser-induced fluorescence detection. And this is actually the same wavelength of laser that we use in all of our systems, uh, 405 nanometers. To start you off, it's easiest to, uh, to start off with the first question. Is there life elsewhere in the solar system? To give you a little bit of perspective for the type of challenge that we're dealing with here, this is a picture. This is Earth uh, taken by the rover Spirit on Mars. And you blow it up and you know you can see we're a couple of pixels. That's awesome. Mars is the closest place to us on Earth that might have ever hosted life. Um, the other really cool places out there in the solar system, the icy moons of Saturn and Jupiter, much, much, much further away. Um, and that's our solar system. What about all the other solar systems? Um, we're not even going to talk about those. Uh, but this means that our instrumentation has to be small, um, energy efficient, compliant with a space and rover environment, and fully automated. And that means that our chemistry has to use low volumes, um, be high speed, highly sensitive, and use relatively simple chemistry. And so our argument here is that these microfabricated bioanalysis systems meet these requirements of spaceflight in a really unique and, and powerful way. Now, before I go any further, let's start off with the paradigm that we use whenever we're looking uh, to try to figure out what's going on in the solar system. Could there be life there or not? Um, now, if you look at a variety of chemical species and their relative abundance, um, that can give you some clues about the organic chemistry that's taking place in an extraterrestrial environment. Um, so all chemistry that life uses is organic chemistry. This is based on carbon, which are the things that we don't even bother writing in in these structures because everything is, is, is so covered in carbon. Um, 
And this type of chemistry exists without life as well. So if you look at, for example, the Murchison meteorite, that has hundreds of different amino acids, which are these guys. Now, amino acids come in two varieties. They have two non-superimposable uh, mirror images. Um, and that gives chirality. In the Murchison meteorite, we see both hands. On Earth, all life on Earth has chosen one, the left hand. Uh, and so we can look at chirality as one of those fingerprints for an astatistical distribution that could be associated with life. Also, the Murchison meteorite has hundreds of amino acids. And you predominantly see short-chained over longer-chained species, more branch-chained rather than linear species. And this is due to the radical chemistry that has formed these things out there in interstellar space. On Earth, we see 20 amino acids enriched at the expense of all the rest of them that are degraded. So um, kind of looking for this statistical distribution that's dependent upon what the chemical processes are that's forming those species. Uh, versus an astatistical distri distribution, which could be the first tantalizing hint that life has evolved in an extraterrestrial location. Um, now that we've determined that we're not looking for a specific molecule, but rather a pattern of molecules, let's talk about what molecules we're actually looking for. Um, we're interested in polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. I mentioned the Murchison meteorite earlier. This is a picture of it. Um, this landed in Australia sometime in the 70s. <coughs> And it's got a very high fraction of these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, and they're ubiquitous in interstellar space. We've got amines and amino acids that we're interested in. These are potentially biomarkers, but they're also ubiquitous in the solar system. We're interested in long chain species. These are not necessarily ubiquitous in the solar system. We probably get them on Titan, which is an example of organic chemistry on a planetary scale, kind of like Earth. It's very cool. Um, we won't talk about Titan today, but ask me about it, and I'll tell you all the stories that I have. Uh, but these would be potentially biomarkers in many locations as well. Um, now, oxidized organic species like acids, uh, carboxylic acids, polycarboxylic acids. Um, we might expect to find these on Mars, which has a highly oxidizing chemistry. And Stephen Benner has even proposed that this molytic acid here might be the last stable or semi-stable species on Mars as things are, are oxidized all the way to carbon dioxide. So this is just an example of what we're looking for. Um, and how do we do this? We use microchip capillary electrophoresis with laser-induced fluorescence detection. The laser-induced fluorescence detection means that we need something that is fluorescent. Our species usually aren't, so we do some chemistry to make them fluorescent. Now, how, we, how do we do that chemistry? We have to use a microfabricated device because we want to do all this small in a portable system. Um, and so we have a microfluidic sample handling system. I'll show you how this works. Uh, using this, we can derivatize species using this chemistry and then separate and analyze uh, using microcapillary CE. Here we've got an example of off-chip processes done completely by people with pipetters. And down here we've got the on-chip process done completely by the micro device. 99% uh, similar. Um, of course, this doesn't operate in a vacuum. It needs external systems to drive it. And so we need a high voltage power supplies to drive our CE. We need um, a bank of solenoids, which aren't really shown here to uh, drive all of our uh, pneumatic operations on our chip. Um, we need the laser-induced fluorescence optics um, and the electronics to control everything. Now, in the interest of time, considering how long I've just been talking about this, I'm going to go super fast through this next slide. Bear with me. Um, this is just the chemistry of how our separations work. We're using capillary zone electrophoresis, which just separates things based on size and charge. By applying a potential, and because our glass is negatively charged, we induce electroosmotic flow, EOF, which pulls everything to the detector. Everything else has its own net mobility, except for neutral species, and that's what separates them. We can use a cross injector to inject sample in, and then we've got a long separation channel here. Uh, so basically, if you look at how this works, you inject by applying potentials, you get a little plug in, and as the plug goes down the column, it separates into species, and then you can detect by shining a laser the same color as the laser I'm shining on it right now. Um, all of this has to happen inside of a microfabricated device, so um, let me walk you through our fabrication protocol for one of these all-glass devices. 
And actually, while I do that, I'll also pass around a, a device. This is not all glass. This is the one that they let me take out of the lab because it bounces instead of breaks. Um, it's got one of our uh, programmable, programmable microfluidic architectures on it, which I'll show in another slide. Um, but the idea here is we start off with a glass wafer. Uh, we usually use borofloat for this, although we're starting to get into quartz uh, because you'll see. Um, here we have to deposit uh, amorphous polysilicon, which is a hard mask, uh, before we do photoresist uh, pattern um, deposition for photolithography. Develop etch away our um, silicon layer, and then do a wet etch with HF, and then strip off the uh, photoresist and the silicon. After this, we can drill holes and do uh, thermal bonding to another glass layer, and that's how we get a fully encapsulated uh, glass channel. Now we can also put down um, a layer of PDMS, and that fle flexible elastomer gasket can give rise to structures like this. Um, now what we've done here is we've actually patterned the PDMS layer, uh, but you can imagine that we could do this by patterning the glass as well. And so in this example, we've got a featureless glass layer We've got a patterned elastomeric layer here. And we've got a fluidic channel that has a discontinuity in it. It has a stop, so fluid can't go across. Now, opposite of this, we've got a displacement chamber. And so when we apply a vacuum to that displacement chamber, that sucks this membrane up, which pulls open the gate and lets fluid in. And not only does it let fluid go across, but that act of sucking that membrane up draws fluid in from the nearest uh, open fluidic reservoir. So if we hook up multiple of these valves in sequence and actuate them sequentially, we generate a little peristaltic pump. That's if you hook three of them together, what happens when you hook a lot of them together? Um, and that would be this example. What we've got here is a rectilinear array of these microvalves that are all connected um, out to, to each of the valve surrounding it, uh, except for these guys, which are stop valves, which control access in from these fluidic reservoirs around the outside. Um, using this structure and simply reprogramming the sequence of actuation of these valves, we can draw in fluid from one reservoir, mix it with fluid from here. This is their water reservoir and send it out, or we're bringing in fluid from here actually, mixing it with here, and sending it out to another reservoir. And so that's the equivalent of labeling a blank sample. Uh, right now the processor has moved on and it's mixing our sample with our dye. And this is the equivalent of labeling the sample and it's shuttling it out here. And you can see in this valve you don't get full mixing, but by the time you've shuttled it through multiple valves, you've actually achieved full mixing. And those of you familiar with microfluidics, which is probably everyone in this room, you know that mixing is actually relatively challenging to achieve uh, within um, these types of time frames. Um, so the, the whole thing is going to go through this process. It can clean the device. You've seen it clean itself a couple of times. Uh, it'll mix sample with standard to generate spiked sample here. It will label that and shuttle it here and then it will label the standard and shuttle it here. And those are the four analyses that we need chemically in order to uh, obtain quantitative compositional analysis. Um, this little video will keep chugging along for the next um, minute and a half or so. The entire process takes a, a little under three minutes. And um, once we've done all of these uh, reactions, for the various compound classes, we get uh, very high fidelity with off-chip manual operations, and uh, along with cleaning in between each device. And so this single device can do all of these operations. You just have to load things uh, into it a little differently and program it correctly. Uh, so this works great on laboratory standards. But we're not analyzing laboratory standards. We want to go into space and analyze real samples. We can't test it in space necessarily because they don't really let you fly until you've proven that you can work. So we've tested it on a number of samples that we can find on Earth that um, are kind of similar to some of the things we might see out there in space. And so uh, one of these locations is, is the Rio Tinto in Spain, 
which is a uh, highly acidic river that has uh, lots of dissolved iron in it. And it's thought that, you know, if Mars was ever warm and wet, as it stopped being so warm and wet, you would see a lot of places that looked like this with uh, just horrible salt concentrations and everything. Now, what's cool about the Rio Tinto is that we can go there and we can see things living in it. Like, even though this is horribly nasty by our standards, there's still stuff that finds a way to live in it. And um, if we wanted to do the chemistry to label amines and amino acids in there, this would be the reaction that we would do. And of course, we would see the amino acid signature of the extremophile population in that river. And we can do the same thing other places, like the um, geothermal region called Bump Ass Hell in Lassen National Park in California, where we can look for carboxylic acids. And of course, see the extremophiles that live there. Life finds a way just about everywhere you go. Uh, if we went to the uh, lava tube caves in the Mojave Desert, we would see the, um, hmm, what's going on here? Uh-oh. Uh there it goes. Okay. Um, we'd see the aldehydes and ketones associated with the booming bat population in those caves. Um, and by the way, that's my helmet trying to get through one of these very tight squeezes. Um, and for PAHs, we went to the Atacama Desert, but the Atacama Desert has all kinds of stuff as well. Um, and we've actually accurately, if not precisely, estimated the age of the last major rain event in the Atacama Desert um, using the um, remaining uh, enantiomeric excess of amino acids in that desert. Now, we also tested on some things that are very abiotic. I showed you a bunch of stuff where there's life. Is that me? Okay. It's, it's, it's distracting me. I'm sorry if it's distracting you, too. Um, so for this, we're looking at uh, irradiated interstellar ice analogs. And this is supposed to be simulating what's going on out there in space. Um, so there, there is a theory that um, you know, the Earth went through a bombardment period that burned off most of its water, because the Earth got too hot for that. And so it lost a lot of its water during that period. And that's why the outer solar system has a lot of water, and we don't, because it's kind of a distillation column, where the lighter stuff ended up out here, and the heavier stuff ended up in the middle. Um, and so where do all of Earth's oceans come from if all that water was lost? Well, it's thought maybe these are cometary impacts from um, wet stuff from the outside getting spun around into the inside. Um, and so it's really important to see what's going on in that environment so that we know what was being delivered to the early Earth uh, during that time. And so we kind of uh, figured that whenever we did a uh, vapor deposition uh, of these various species onto a silver puck and hit them with simulated galactic cosmic radiation, we'd get amino acids. We kind of knew that. What we didn't expect was that we would also get dipeptides. Um, and so what this could mean as, is that uh, when life arose on the early Earth, it may have done so at least in part by these uh, biopolymers of an exogenous origin. And so that's, that's one of the, the exciting things that we can do just with the science. Um, but now I want to leave the science behind and start talking about the engineering for a little bit. Now, we've, we've proposed systems for a number of places. We were on the ExoMars rover as the URI instrument package, or at least as a part of the URI instrument package, before we got descoped in 2009, uh, which actually forced me into early graduation. We proposed to the Mars 2020 uh, uh, investigation. We've got um, a technology demonstration uh, option that we proposed as part of a discovery mission at one point. Um, and we continue to try these, these avenues. Uh, but what we've recently got funding for is this very low TRL development under Picasso funding, which is a NASA ROSES program, uh, to develop one of these systems to go on a Europa impactor. And so let's talk about that in a little more detail. Well, let's first look at Europa. And so Europa is this uh, moon of Jupiter. It's got a crust that is made entirely of water ice. And it is so cold there that the water ice is as hard as granite. Beneath that crust is a liquid water ocean. And beneath that liquid water ocean is a rocky core. From what we can tell, anywhere you get direct contact of liquid water ocean with rock on a planetary scale, 
you get um, a process called serpentinization where the water subducts into the rock. Um, you get these interactions that oxidize the rock. That's a serpentinization type reaction. Um, the rock heats up, the stuff, or the water heats up, the rock heats up because it's an exothermic reaction. Uh, the stuff in the water gets reduced and it gets pushed back up through the surface. This is called a hydrothermal vent. Um, you might be familiar with them, having giant six foot tube worms. Those are magmatic hydrothermal systems on the axis of spreading zones on the Earth. These don't necessarily have that. They don't necessarily have magmatic heating, but they do have these ser serpentinization heating systems. Probably. And we just got confirmation with a uh, Cassini mission flyby of the plume of Enceladus uh, that there may be ongoing hydrothermal activity on Enceladus. We think it may be happening on Europa too. What's cool about this is that this gives us some sort of chemical energy fuel that could help support living systems. So now we're getting very excited about Europa because not only do we think that it might have those systems, but it's also got all this red stuff on the surface where, um, where ice plates move and we get effluent from that subsurface ocean probably spilling out onto the surface. What's going on on Europa? What's making it red? We all want to know so badly. Uh, the problem with Europa is it's hard to land there. You think about a landing mission to, uh, to Mars, and, you know, you come in, you burn up your heat shield as you hit the atmosphere, and then you like launch a supersonic parachute, and that gets you most of the rest of the way down before you inflate airbags and bounce around on the surface, or lower yourself on a sky crane, which seems crazy, but works. We have proof. Um, so we came up with this crazy idea, what if we didn't slow down on Europa because it doesn't have an atmosphere, uh, so you can't slow down. But in order to get to Europa, um, the easiest way uses a Holman transfer, which puts you there with a differential velocity of about five kilometers per second. So now our idea to just not slow down sounds a little crazy. Um, but we, we proposed it to NASA and we said, well, what we'll do is we'll build this kinetic impactor. And we'll just hit the surface, we'll make a giant ice crater, we'll bury ourselves a couple of meters in the ice, we'll be able to get fresh ice samples that haven't been completely irradiated away by the magnetosphere of Jupiter. Wouldn't that be really cool? It's only 50,000 Gs after all. Um, and NASA said, sure, here's some money, go for it. Um, and so now what we've got to do is figure out how to get our detection optics stable enough that they can survive that kind of an impact. And so our idea here is to use indium bump bonding to permanently weld these components together. Uh, we're also interested in integrating an electrochemical sensor so that we can get um, conductivity measurements which could tell us about the salts, which would tell us a lot about what's going on on Europa. Um, we've got to figure out if we can make one of these micro devices survive because I told you it's glass. Um, people tend to not think of glass as being very strong. We've got news on that one. Um, and also because we're using these pneumatic uh, valves, we found that you know, just overpressurizing one of these valves causes it to burst. So what if we put in something, a fluid to actuate it that's not compressible? What if we used an incompressible fluid? And that's how we ended up switching to, to hydraulics. And of course, we also need to figure out how to get the electronics to fit on this thing. Um, so let's start off with the detection optics. And we'll just start with optics. Uh, we had this really old design. Um, it's actually not that old, it's 2003. Um, out of my PhD advisors group where um, in order to do laser induced fluorescence detection from one of these micro devices, um, basically just hooked up a laser with a um, photodiode here and a filter. And so you cut a hole in the filter, your laser can pass through the filter, be focused into a spot through this uh, half ball lens here, a spot in your microchannel. Fluorescence comes out in all directions and it's captured by the half ball lens, collimated so that it comes down linearly. Uh, it goes through this filter and so any directly reflected laser light is cut off so you can improve your sensitivity because what you're looking for is those longer wavelength uh, fluorescence uh, light. That comes through and is then detected on this microfabricated uh, photodiode that again has a hole in the, um, has a, a hole in the middle. Um, so we thought we'd try to build this again um, 
and, and indium bump bond the whole thing together, but because we're not just interested in um, these small organic molecules, we're also interested in PAHs. We thought we'd include a uh, LED on the other side of the wafer uh, so that we could do some absorbance detection. It turns out this is generally a good idea anyway. If you look at all of the components involved in a laser-induced fluorescence detection system, uh, this is pretty much the smallest money can buy right now. This is a custom objective. I mean, this one is not. This is a cylinder that I drew in SolidWorks, but it's the same size as a uh, custom objective that you can buy, and that's you know $10,000 to have fabbed. This is the smallest uh, spectrometer that money can buy, and this is a laser diode from the tip of this uh, laser pointer. Um, fabricating the whole thing together in a single stack, uh, we can actually cut down on that size by, um, by many, many times. Um, and so where are we at on this? Well, our first objective was just to build a breadboard system so that we can test those optical components together. And this was the, uh, the first project of graduate student Zach Duca and the group. Um, this was an early breadboard system, and what we can see is we've got three-dimensional uh, translation on, on these uh, three stages. That lets us look at all different spots of a micro device. Uh, so we've got lots of flexibility there. We've got um, a filter cube uh, here that we can easily just pull out and replace with something else if we want to go to a different wavelength laser. So we can test lots of different systems this way. Uh, where is the laser? The laser is here. Um, we've got a fiber optic going back to the spectrometer from here, a little turning mirror here, and this is a, um, a pretty high numerical aperture um, objective so that we can get pretty high sensitivity on this system. This is what the system looks like today now that it is completely complete. Uh, it's got this nice black enclosure so that we can keep all the stray light out. Um, we've got a stage set up so that we can accept uh, various micro devices and apply high voltage. Um, and uh, started putting in all kinds of new things to make it even more sensitive. Um, early data, we can obtain uh, optical spectra with our spectrometer and we can start averaging and getting um, signal response in time. Um, limit of detection currently is on the order of 3 nanomolar, which is on par with other systems. We haven't even really optimized the optical stack yet, so uh, we're excited about this. So that means we're ready to go back and start building these systems and testing them uh, using various components of that breadboard system. We'd also like to get into uh, electrochemical detection, um, which would require depositing electrodes on chip. This is a um, pretty early design that we, we've looked at. Uh, it turns out um, electrodes built this way won't work exactly the way that we want them to. So we're kind of going back to the drawing board and uh, redoing how we would fabricate some of these electrodes. Of course, the contactless conductivity is still good, and we might try that in the near future. Um, so that's detection. It's not the only thing we need to do. We also need to worry about our valves and whether they'll survive. And um, one of the early things we saw was that pneumatically actuated valves burst on the overpressures. Uh, and so we need to go to something hydraulically actuated. And the problem with a hydraulically actuated valve is that you are not assembling these in the working fluid. So you need some way to actually fill your, your channel. And so everything has to have these uh, inlet and outlet channels. Uh, early device design here um, was put together in uh, in this um, breadboard microfluidic test bed um, that Thomas Cantrell, a research scientist in my group, built. And we've started doing a little bit of testing, and what we've really fi figured out is that a full PDMS structure is not going to give you the um, kind of rigidity that you need in order to achieve actuation using a hydraulic system. And so we're going to have to switch to, to glass fab which we love PDMS because it's so great for rapid prototyping. It's just you can't prototype everything with PDMS. Um, next thing we were kind of worried about is uh, how do these chips survive with age? And so I just wanted to show you a mission design for the Cassini mission. Um, launch in October 1997. Then we swing out go around Venus, come back, swing around Earth, swing around Venus again, go out to Jupiter, and then finally arrive at Saturn in 2004. Um, and so the, the rule of thumb here is if you can survive for 10 years and thermocycling from 
um, minus 80 to 50 degrees multiple times, you can probably survive this or whatever your mission design will be based on your relation between Earth and Saturn at your time of launch. Um, but the good news was is that we had some really old micro devices from Fabd in 2005. So this has been uh, about 10 years since these were made. Um, and so we could go and do at least some preliminary testing to see whether they would survive the, the 10 years that we would look at. Of course, these were not thermocycled from minus 80 to 60 degrees Celsius. They were kept in my garage in Southern California. Um, so it's not the perfect analog, but we can start to get into some of those thermocycling tests after this. Uh, of course, CHIP doesn't operate in a vacuum, and it's been 10 years since the uh, hardware that was fabricated to operate it was built. So we had to build a new one. This was uh, Zach's very first project, was to design uh, a manifold to operate it, have it built, and there's the device assembled inside, and then start trying to open these old valves. And um, this is a little video of that valve opening. And so there it went. Um, you can just barely see the change in the reflection down here. This is the valve. This is the shadow. And so you can see that, that shadow change when that valve goes on ahead and, and, and opens up. Let's watch it one more time. And you should be able to see it right there. Um, so we started opening all the valves one at a time. Um, in this video, this valve is already opening. And this one will open right there. Uh, and so this kind of tells that all of the criticisms that we've been receiving in the literature, that our valves will seal permanently shut upon any extended storage, that criticism is completely unfounded. And we've even propagated that myth ourselves, um, our own team, because we'd never actually done these experiments. Uh, and so this was actually a huge result. But back to the, the whole reason why we're doing this, it's because we want to go to Europa and lawn, land a giant lawn dart in its surface at 50,000 Gs. So how do we actually do this? Well, it turns out that Sierra Lobo, which is a, a company in Ohio, they have a giant air gun and a magnetic capture system that can simulate these really high impacts. Um, so whenever we wrote this proposal, we kind of did this very like hand wavy finite element analysis model using like a solid block of quartz and like titanium to mount it in place. Uh, and said, hey, look, yeah, you know, glass, it actually has a really high mechanical strength. Like, that's why you can build really thin uh, champagne flutes out of it. And you can't build really thin champagne flutes out of, like, cast iron. Um, so, look, we're going to be fine, right? And, and so, so NASA totally bought that. Now we have to go back and convince ourselves. Um, and so we started doing more hardcore models and started increasing the fidelity of our model to our actual system. And so here's the optical stack uh, on top of a glass wafer. Um, inside of this mount, and what we're seeing is, of course, we're exceeding the mechanical strength of glass at some of the, the edges, and so we need to build something that doesn't have uh, that problem. And so a collaborator out at Texas Tech, John Q. Kim, and his student started um, building designs for a manifold that could house this system. Um, and we started doing models for that as well, although I don't have the results from the models here for you today. I did go ahead and build this system. So this is what a, a solid chunk of aluminum with just enough cutouts for your uh, device and optics looks like. Uh, and so we said, you know, uh, Zach and Thomas, they just got trained up to, to use the machine shop over in physics here. Why don't they build a version of this so that we can go put it in the air gun and, and catch it with the magnetic capture system? And Jung Q says, oh, don't worry about it. You can just send the one we had built. And I'm like, no, that's actually your like, functional test model that you want to be perfect for what we're doing. You don't want to do that. It, it, and, and Jung Q's like, no, no, it's solid aluminum. It won't get hurt. And then Phil out at Sierra Lobo, he's like, <laughs> We can hurt your aluminum. <laughs> so uh, well, we, we should be testing soon. And those should be very, very fun results to talk about. Um, but moving on uh, so that I can talk about some of the other ways that we use microfluidics, uh, let's, let's go to what are the limits of life on Earth. Um, and so one of the, uh, the projects that we're, 
we're working on now, it's uh, feldspar field exploration and life detection sampling for planetary and astrobiological research. Um, it's nice that the description of our project also matches a cool acronym that matches a type of mineral that you only get in Iceland because our field work, or you don't only get in Iceland, but you get the, uh, the nice Arctic feldspar there. Um, because this is a project to go to Iceland. And the idea here is that we can do this as an analog of Mars because we've got remote sensing data on Earth and on Mars that can help us pick a field site, just like we would pick a landing site on Mars. And then once we get down close, we can use a, um, an unmanned aerial vehicle, a little quadcopter, just like we could use a uh, Martian helicopter that's being proposed as a um, addendum onto the Mars 2020 mission to help us narrow down our field site selection even more. Then, uh, just like the Mars rovers have things like PanCam that help them pick where they're going next, and they actually designed PanCam to be about eye height with stereo vision because this is the way geologists see the world. And so they wanted it to be this little like roving field geologist so that they could pick the sites. And so we've got our actual field geologist, Elena, uh, coming into the field with us. And so that's how we can mimic that. And then once we get even further down, we've got these field lab uh, techniques that we can use to analyze the samples, the same that you would do with an in-situ analysis suite. And that helps us pick out the samples that we drag back uh, to the laboratory for um, our, our laboratory analyses, uh, which is, is similar to a sample return type mission. And so every year we get to cycle this again and see how well we did and see, see how representative are these samples. Um, this was our, our team from last year uh, in 2015. Um, and we, we go to a number of, of sites. Last year we went to Femvodahals and uh, Melefetlstander. Uh, down here we've got Heme, and up here we've got Nornahran, which is a brand new volcanic site. We'll be going to Nornahran this year, uh, and then we'll be going back to all the sites uh, in subsequent years. Um, just to give you a little bit more of an idea of what these look like, if you look at them from Google Earth, sometimes you get good images of the basaltic tephra that we're dealing with, and other times you get good images of snow, depending on when the satellite flew overhead. Um, and we're starting to get good UAV coverage, and that's going to be a major part of the, uh, the next upcoming trips. This is an example image from one of our, our UAV things. This is a, uh, an orange blanket that's set down as a sizing marker to show us how, how um, big things are. Over here, I believe, is Vincent, and then Dave is over here, and that's uh, 100 meters apart. This to give you an idea of the sampling that we're looking at. And so what we're seeing is that all of our samples look pretty much the same. They were all resurfaced by the same volcano. And what happens is a volcano shoots up ash, and the ash um, kind of cools off and settles out everywhere. And that's called tephra, and it's basalt because that's the mineral, and so we're talking about basaltic tephra. And all of the ash has about the same grain size. Um, and it's all the same mineral composition because it came out of the same volcano at the same time. And it just covers the entire region, just like this entire region has been covered with it, all up to a certain depth. And so the whole place has been catastrophically resurfaced by this geological event. And the idea is these two samples that are 100 meters apart, they look the exact same. We would land anywhere in this place and feel like we were taking a representative area of, of the region if we were landing on Mars. Um, but maybe they're not the same. And how do you parameterize how similar things are and how different they are, especially if you're worried about looking at the habitability of an environment like we're so concerned about on Mars. And so we've gone and we've collected samples and done this ATP analysis. And so ATP is this biomarker that um, shows you kind of how active organisms are in the soil. And you know, what we see is that we're getting statistically significant differences between samples that are only 10 centimeters apart. These are 10 centimeters apart. Um, these two sites are one meter apart. These sites are then uh, 10 meters apart, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and so that's kind of disheartening, um, because it means that the difference between detecting the, the ancient life on Mars and not detecting it could be 
two samples that look exactly the same and you just went this way to pick one up versus this way to pick it up. So what does that mean? It means we need more samples, uh, a lot more samples. And so we're really trying to study this and, and also just to figure out how quickly it is biodiversity recover after one of these catastrophic events. And so what we're seeing is that just the difference between 2013 and 2015, uh, if you look at the orders of magnitude of these scale bars, here's 1,000 uh, luminescence units. Uh, we can correct this for a relative number of cell cells, but um, that's not necessarily the best correction factor, so we'll just leave it like this. Um, but we're getting orders of magnitude more um, activity in just a single year. Now that's not using microchip stuff, but what, what we are interested in is kind of using these same techniques, not just to look at the basaltic tephra, which is kind of our main focus right now, but to, to also look at, at fumaroles, which are these uh, areas where superheated water comes up through the surface. Uh, you get these kind of clay deposits. Each one of these little holes in the ground is where steam is coming up. And uh, this whole thing is, is liquid that's draining down into this, uh, uh, let's see, it's draining down this way and from here. Uh, I'm kind of lost on this map right now, but that's because I'm busy flying the quadcopter and taking pictures of these guys who are actually doing work. Um, if we take some samples from here, we get a whole range of thermal gradients, and this is not from this fumarole, it's just, I like this picture of this fumarole, and these are the samples that we actually looked at. Um, we can see that we're getting uh, very different um, amounts of organisms, depending on the organism, um, in the various uh, temperature gradients that we're looking at. So this is a cyanobacter that um, we get kind of similar levels until we get to that highest temperature and then it drops off. Um, but that's not the only thing that we're interested in doing. Uh, we're also interested in using this new microfluidic technique that um, we just realized could be used for these extreme environments. And so this is, uh, this is iChip technology which has been demonstrated for, you know, mesophilic areas like wet dirt around Georgia and, you know, the ocean and places like that. But it had never been applied to one of these extreme environments. The idea here is that you just pick up dirt out of, out of your environment. Um, you shake it up with some water to kind of pull cells out of it. You inoculate those into the little individual wells on one of these micro devices. And then you put uh, semi-permeable membranes on either side of those, those little wells and plant it back where you found it. And that way nutrients can flow in and um, waste products can flow out in the natural environment where the microbes are used to growing. And so you don't get a culturing bias from dragging them back to the lab. And so you might be able to grow things that you otherwise couldn't grow. Where this gets super exciting is uh, the fact that we can now do this with thermophiles. Um, and if you could get a pure culture of a thermophile, you could then correlate the genetics with the lipids, with the proteins, and maybe even start doing some protein crystallography, which would be just incredibly exciting. So this was, uh, this was Thomas Cantrell's project, and um, we took this out to Iceland this last time. Here's a, a picture of one of these devices, and whenever you look at the side up close, uh, you can see a number of these little wells that still have auger in them after being soaked in one of these, you know, 90 degree pH 2 hot springs for a week and a half. Um, really excited about this. We don't have any hard data to show you yet, but we do have some indication that we are getting thermophiles actually growing in these plugs, a small handful. We don't yet have confirmation whether that handful is all together as a monoculture or a handful that's dispersed. Um, but we're really excited about this. Uh, and the last place that we'll go, oh, we'll go through it so fast because I've got five minutes and I'd like to give you guys some time to answer, ask some questions so that I can answer them for you. Um, let's go back to Europa real quick. I had mentioned these uh, hydrothermal systems that you can get because of the serpentinization reaction underneath that uh, subsurface ocean underneath the icy crust. So this is now where we're trying to focus because what's interesting is you can precipitate out these little membranes at these hydrothermal mounds that form naturally and we see these with like the lost city 
uh, system on Earth. But the main thing that you're getting there is uh, carbonates because the chemistry on Earth has changed from what it would be um, on an icy moon. And so now we're, we're getting away from, from Earth. Uh, we're looking at these, uh, these icy moons. And we're interested in seeing, can we duplicate these little um, membranes that might be formed in those situations? And this is kind of gaining inspiration from some work done by uh, Mike Russell and Larry Barge at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where they grew these structures and were able to generate some iron sulfide uh, membranes that were tantalizing clo tantalizingly close to the active site crystal structures and some of our, our enzymes. Now, any chemist will look at this and they'll say, that's no way to do membrane science. You don't know the surface area of that structure. You don't know the thickness. There's no way you can do any good science with that thing. And it's all because they tried to grow it using turbulent flow. So what do we do? We say, let's grow it on the microscale so we can use laminar flow, so we can get away from those turbulent structures and actually be able to grow controlled membranes. Uh, and so a little proof of concept experiment here. Uh, I, I called this preliminary data when I pitched this project to Max Dorn um, and said, hey, look, there's a membrane. I didn't tell him that this didn't really work very well or very easily at all, but I was like, yeah, I totally did this at JPL. It's easy, you can do it. Um, and so he believed me and he ran off and he built this uh, PDMS device um, and uh, started growing these beautiful membranes. Uh, now, I, I made this sound super easy. It was actually really hard. There was a bunch of steps that he had to do to make this work. Um, but if you can control the flow rate very well and control your chemistry, you can actually grow uh, very regular uh, membranes on the microscale at the junction of um, the, the laminar flow uh, between two fluids. Um, and so moral of the story is one, um, Max is graduating, so if you're looking for an excellent person to hire, I, I would highly recommend him. And two, um, never tell a Georgia Tech undergrad that something could possibly be impossible because they'll just make it happen. Um, wonderful people, especially Max. Uh, and, and one thing that we did find is that uh, after formation, our membrane um, changed color as we allowed it to oxidize. And so this is another one of the benefits of using the micro devices over using that turbulent flow system. Um, and that is that we can take this device, we can build our membranes on it, and then we can take it down for characterization without oxidizing and changing the chemical structure of that membrane. And so we can start to really do uh, good characterization experiments. Of course, we're not just interested in this from like a what is the membrane chemistry on a hydrothermal vent underneath the uh, subsurface ocean of an icy moon of Saturn. We're also interested in like, hey, we can now build a semi-permeable inorganic membrane on chip. Uh, does anyone want to help us build a fuel cell? Um, sounds cool to me. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to leave it there. We get to do all these cool uh, explorations of these, these big questions, um, but it's all because we've got our, our microfabricated core technology at the center. And it's also all because I have a wonderful group. Uh, this is the, uh, the original team from exactly a year ago. Uh, we have since grown somewhat significantly. Uh, there are many people still not even pictured in this. I'd like to thank um, the state of Georgia and Georgia Tech for funding. NASA has been very generous to us with the Picasso and a P star. Um, and the Center for Chemical Evolution has helped us with some work that we didn't show here because it isn't even tangentially related to microfluidics. Um, so there, I will thank you guys for coming and invite any questions you may have. Nothing. It must have been boring. Um, so we're, we're just now getting into to using the IEN. Uh, we've been trying to stick with um, PDMS type devices so that they would be, you know, within the course structure for an undergrad uh, that's not in anything related to microfabrication. Um, but now that we've got grad students that aren't taking classes any longer in research scientists, we're planning to jump in after our field work this summer. Uh, yeah. 
And actually, I think there's a soft lithography course there is. Thursday. And I don't know how many people total in that class. Somewhere in the like ten-ish range, three of them will be our guys. Fifteen. Yeah. So, yeah, three of them will be from our group as we try to start doing more of the the soft lithography here.